it is uh, uh how shall i say this uh, it is a long way from west hall to central hall i didn't want to talk about south hall but man oh man i could back and forth to those halls was just amazingly difficult that's why they put the loop in between and that wasn't very good, David, because it didn't take you very long to realize that you wanted to be on the east end of West Hall, for instance, but the loop takes you to the west end. And uh, the same thing goes with Central, because North Hall is under construction, then they they pull you down almost almost to South Hall, and then you have to walk <sighs> way back. That's all I tried. It was, not, it was not well planned out, and when they laid out where the booths would be, they really didn't pay attention to what people were going to have to put up with. Just to get to the concession area in Central Hall was a huge hike because you had to go across what was the old parking lot, then up and across and through the top of the uh, the old North Hall and then down. It was just not a whole lot of fun. That and try to get from the West Hall to the South Hall when you're trying to go to the Rodian and Schwartz booth. And so you had I, I took the yeah. I took the loop. That was a mistake because they drop you off in the back of South Hall and then you have to walk through all these empty halls to finally get there. And then you realize that on the second floor of the South Hall where Rody is, there was maybe 10 booths. And that's well, you that's, gotta wonder who that's they what I was off. saying. They did not set out this logistically very well. And if you if you look at the map that that you could get, the, about the only thing I can say is it was an interesting ride through the little tunnel. I did it once; that was enough. And uh, frankly, it was easier to walk most of the time. You're not going to buy a Tesla. Not a tube. Not a, not not a not an underground tube. Test. You got to wonder what happens. When anyway, Sunday morning was the uh, was the uh, Nautel presentation, and uh, they they took uh, in some three hundred people this year, a uh, large group. The uh, NAB attendance has been posted at about sixty one thousand, which is a lot less than it used to be, uh, approaching a hundred thousand or so, ninety a hundred thousand. So it's about two thirds of what it was most recently, but the Nortel had about three hundred folks, and they actually started the first hour with more generic broadcast concerns, and then filtered into Nortel equipment and tips and tricks. And of course, our, our buddy Jeff was uh, going on about uh, grounding and airflow and maintenance things like that, which which was pretty good, and. As usual, Nautel provided a very nice lunch, and then they had a couple of breakout sessions uh, for the AUI and the GV2, uh, which is uh, it's a transmitter which they're putting everything together in a compact, uh, orchestrated way. They advertise it just add audio so that you don't have to have four or five boxes. Just bring the audio to your transmitter. And there you are. The one problem for some of the folks, and yes, uh, <laughs> I was there too, uh, is that first of all, it was that Flamengo, which was down the strip. And the parking was kind of a real pain uh, to find and utilize, unless you wanted to pay 20 bucks for a morning parking. Uh, and then the other thing is the show opened on Sunday morning so that... Everyone that was at the Nautel this program, well, they weren't on the floor. And it was interesting to see how things have changed over the past couple of years where there are more of these so-called educational gatherings, PREC and uh, Ennis and uh, BEA, uh, a lot of things going on the four or five days before the NAB, and a lot of those folks they got on the floor Sunday morning into Sunday afternoon. And there was a pretty good uh, amount of traffic. Um, I don't know if this is going to come up right away or whether it's going to be, uh, no, that isn't going to do it. 
<laughs> well, that's not going to be, I'm going to stop that right there because that's not what I want everybody to have to deal with. Uh, at any rate, um, Bundy was okay on the floor. Uh, the exhibitors in the radio hall, part of North Hall, said it was kind of ebb and flow, some good, some bad. Yesterday was uh, fairly thin most of the day, and today they've uh, brought the cannons in uh, to uh, see if they can hit anybody in the aisles. I have heard uh, the word is that in 2026, assuming we're all still here and the NAB is, uh, there will not be a Sunday morning start for this, the floor. They're going to go back to a Monday start. And uh, there had been quite a few complaints about that. But again, it Las Vegas is not what it was, folks. Everything is... Well, an example. David was moaning about fried foods. And if you went to the concession stands... Back three, four years ago. Yeah, you're gonna pay seven fifty or nine dollars for a sandwich. Sixteen and eighteen dollars this year at any of those concession stands. And you know, it was it wasn't exactly the worst, but it certainly wasn't the best food in the world. And then again, as many know, just getting into a hotel in dealing with uh, the many different uh, issues. Some of the hotels, and I heard about this from more than a few people, the resort fee was more than they paid for the hotel room, especially if they got a hotel room that was off the strip, and uh, that wasn't a real thrill. In in my case, uh, I was kind of, uh, I don't know if that was a smart thing to do or not. I think it was. I went and um, uh, stayed at the Circus Circus. Uh, you know, and everybody, okay, it was a room with a bed in it. And you had to get through the, uh, the lobby and a bunch of families. But it was so close to the West Hall that you could walk it without killing yourself. That was the big deal. Didn't have to worry about parking. Didn't have to worry about any other issue. Just get out, walk down there. And it was beautiful, sunny days. We didn't have any problems whatsoever. So what we can do from here, uh, I'm going to kind of toy with this a little more, see if I can bring something up that will show us something that is not sideways, which is kind of an annoyance factor here uh, otherwise. Uh, and um, maybe uh, uh, some of you have a uh, a, a uh, high point that you saw. I thought, with all the talk about AI, that you were going to see it in every single booth, and th it didn't work out that way. Uh, there was AI on the floor. Primarily, I thought, on the TV side and a few on the audio side. But it wasn't as it wasn't as pervasive as I thought I was going to see. And since, David, you're an AI head, maybe you would like to comment on that. Um, well, I saw some AI, and it, uh, some of it I agree with, some of it I don't. But I thought we would be seeing something for AI on the back office side of broadcast, like AI to help doing sales presentations and things. And I didn't see that. And that, that really surprised me. I thought there would be AI uh, to help do scheduling. And I didn't see that either. Yeah, several of the automation systems uh, had parts of AI built into it. Uh, parts, but not a complete system. Yes, you just interrupted me, I was going to say, but not entire systems. It's kind of a first, you know, V1, version one. And uh, there was more there was more like in the ENCO uh, booth where AI was uh, utilized 
uh, to translate uh, and and bring the audio in. But uh, as an example, there is AI now in several of the other automation systems, uh, as the folks at DASTIC pointed out, that it can actually identify what kind of alert is coming in and then schedule uh, an ad or uh, file after an EAS alert that's appropriate to it. And there's a use of AI that makes a certain amount of sense. Here's one that I've got right side up. Uh, this is Rich Redmond over at BELNOS. And one of the things that they were focused on this year was the MDCL. So I'll let uh, Rich talk a bit. So we're here at the BELNOS booth with Rich Redmond and the MCDL that has been produced for any transmitter. Any contemporary transmitter, any contemporary AM transmitter built for about the past 15 to 20 years. And so what will the MCDL do for us? So it will uh, allow broadcasters to save uh, of up to 60% on operating costs by basically reducing, reducing the carrier power when the modulation levels are very high and you wouldn't hear any noise. So it overcomes the noise, reduces the carrier power. A typical 10 kilowatt station, if they ran 10 kilowatts half of the day, uh, would save about 6K um, in a year. If they ran it all the time, it would save them about 12K a year. So significant savings, but, but good savings for lower powers as well. Okay, well that's good. And it retrofits almost any transmitter that's out there. Yeah, very flexible. Very good. Thank you, Rich. Thanks a lot. I thought that was interesting that Virtually any transmitter from the last 15 or 20 years can install MDCL. Now, of course, as he points out, that uh, power level is going to make a big difference as to how much savings you might get. And the fact is that uh, a one kilowatt transmitter is not going to save you as much as it's going to cost to install this for the first year or two. Um, unfortunately... Uh, what I've got here, for instance, uh, I've got, I've got, <laughs> I've got <laughs> the new um, AM uh, modulation monitor from um, from uh, Innovonics. Unfortunately, it's sideways. So, if someone would like to talk for a minute, I'll go back and I'll keep looking, see if I can get this thing straight. Well, Barry, don't worry about it. I look at the, I watch with an iPad, so I'll just turn the iPad sideways, and that'll <laughs> take care of it. <laughs> All right. All right, Marvin, you win. Tom Booth with Louis, and uh, he's going to tell us about their new product. The new oh, this is the Davicom booth, this, this first one. Neuro that uh, makes some really good use of the axons. So tell yes. me about it. Thank you very much. So, so this is a new product line that we unveiled this year. Uh, we have the Axon and the Neuro. They are GPIO modules that will help you convert any sensors or any dry contacts, uh, voltages to SNMP. So they are completely self-contained. They have a web-based environment. And they, you can see your, the status of anything you connect to those over this uh, list view that is completely customizable. You can have logging and uh, so on and there's also a way to create automations as well with these jobs that allows you to create uh, scripts without a single line of code so they are very intelligent again completely self-contained so they will continue to execute anything even though you're not connected to them and the neuro that we see right here is a way to com combine multiple axons together um, and form a single uh, unit and a single ip to connect Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, if you didn't crick your neck so far that you couldn't find that out, the Axon is a very interesting product that, for many places, uh, stations now have <laughs> IP connections to control everything. So buying a complete remote control system, uh, sometimes folks don't want to do that. Uh, because they only need one or two things to, you know, recycle the uh, computer or uh, to turn on off a particular light. And so that's what this axon will do is it lets you monitor and control 
uh, a few things. And then uh, now you can use their uh, new product to monitor multiple exons and see things like that. That hey, worked Barry, for you, Marvin? Hey, hey Barry, on that, uh, on their uh, box where they uh, combine everything together, did you happen to ask them, which would, if I had been there, the question I'd probably ask every vendor, what level of security they have on that box if you're going to connect to it IP that's going to keep uh, other people from, uh, you know, attempting to get into your uh, transmitter control site or whatever. Did you happen to ask them about that? That's a very good question. Uh, and and the one that I can tell you for sure uh, is the, uh, the Gates Air Intraplex which uh, I didn't know this, but when Harris bought Intraplex, it was a uh, product which was going into uh, police departments, uh, government agencies. Uh, Tony Gervasi, who is in charge of it, uh, explained to me that FBI, CIA, uh, DEA, all of those uh, agencies use the Intraplex because of its high security that has not had a known hacking hacking incident at all, and uh, therefore, uh, for broadcasters, it it has a sense of security, although much more uh, than broadcasters need for for their uh, safety. Uh, everything else, all the manufacturers, they all will tell you that if you put up a proper firewall. <laughs> and protect yourself, you'll be okay. Shouldn't proper uh, IP security be assumed at this point? I know it isn't, but shouldn't it be at this point? Well, David, is it really true that the problem is more so that uh, you, ha you, you have to use 80, uh, port 80? Uh, it's almost impossible to get through most of these applications that use browsers without port 80 being involved. So you almost have to go to a VPN beyond a firewall. Well, I like to think of it that 80 is like the uh, the highway and uh, your firewall is the toll booth. And you just have to, it has to be really up to date and at least uh, a secure a secure gate has to be there. I mean, if someone wants to get into your system, they're going to get into it, no matter what. Just like if uh, you're locking your house up uh, and putting an alarm up and you say, oh, I'm protected against thieves. If they want to get in, they're going to get in. Um, you don't don't know how long it's going to take you take them to uh, break through your system. But if someone wants to, they're going to. So... Uh, safety by uh, obscurity. Is that what you're saying? On the screen now. Okay. Well, we're here at Innovatics with Ben Barber, <laughs> president of the company and uh, chief uh, bottle washer and janitor. Ben, uh, tell us what you have new here with this AM monitor. We have the Model 526 AM modulation monitor. It's a 2U box. It has uh, metering on the front panel. It has an LCD uh, touchscreen. So you can set up different parameters, you can look at different meters, you can look at your modulation, signal strength level. It also has a web interface. Uh, you can set up uh, two different high-level uh, high inputs, high-level one, high-level two, or antenna input. So you can monitor it that way. It's frequency agile. You can make up to 30 presets, which would be a lot for, uh, for an AM station to monitor 30 in a market. But you could do that, and then you can enable station rotation so it will rotate through those presets, and you'll be able to uh, load the alarm conditions and get those alarm conditions. As far as some of the, the screens, you've got a spectrum plot, so you can see the 10 kilohertz mask. Uh, you can also look at a, a wider bandwidth if you want to look at adjacent channels and see what's there. Uh, you can do a band scanner, uh, which is probably have done this, it just takes a few seconds to scan the band and you actually see what kind of RF uh, signals are at your location and what you're picking up. Very handy if, if you've got somebody clobbering you or coming in next to you. So here we are at 1250 and uh, you can
can see we've got lots of signal. We're coming in direct anyway. Uh, you've got uh, oscilloscope measurements. So that, you don't have to drag a scope out to the site. You've got that for looking for your, your modulation. And then also uh, day and night uh, conditions. So if you're a sun up to sunset station, you can pre-populate these with your times. That way when you go to low signal condition or at night, you don't uh, get a low signal alarm because it knows, oh, this is, I should be using a different alarm condition. Excellent. Well, thank you. All Appreciate right. Thanks for coming by. I asked, uh, I asked uh, Ben uh, if they were selling many of them because so many stations have stopped running mod monitors when they were made voluntary. He uh, says they've got a lot of orders, which I find encouraging because I believe broadcasters should do more testing. Okay. I don't know if I've got Tony Gervasi with the Intraplex. Uh, I'm just sort of quickly running through these, but uh, Gates Air has also come up with a series of low-power uh, analog, low-power transmitters uh, for translator and LPFM use. And here's, uh, here's Ted. So we're at the Gates Air booth with Ted Lance, and they have a brand new Flexiva product, and Ted, tell us about it, please. Okay, Barry. Um, we have the what we call the GX series. The GX series is our uh, goes from 50 watts up to 10 kilowatts. It's an analog only, FM analog only transmitter. So what we've done is to have that uh, be more worldwide than some of our other products have been. And uh, the night there's a lot of nice features and functionalities built within the different series. For example, they have uh, built-in audio players, so that can be a backup to your normal composite or your AES input. The full HTML5 for remote control to have remote access to the transmitter. Uh, very efficient and very compact. So at the 10 kilowatt in the GX, it's a 5RU uh, uh, integrated with an integrated exciter all in the compact unit very small size in 10 kilowatt and 5 kilowatt in a 5RU chassis. And then we go from there if at three and a half, we're in a three RU chassis at the one kilowatt and the two kilowatt is two RU, um, hot swappable power supplies. And, and again, it's bounding up on that ROI for the high efficiency that's built within the transmitters themselves. Well, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. That was Gates Air. I found it interesting that there are a number of low-power transmitters being uh, fabricated and sold uh, because of the sudden jump in LPFMs, in translators, and such. And several manufacturers were commenting that uh, they were doing good business with low-power transmitters. And that's not a huge money maker, but, you know, you get a bunch of them, and you can make some money. For those of you that uh, have known about P-Tech, you may be aware that it's now CW Broadcast. That circuit works. That's Kyle McGrill. And Kyle has just been working furiously uh, to correct the circuit and feature problems that have caused many a P-Tech owner to despair. And he's coupling that with a very uh, liberal customer service plan for new and older boxes. So it's worth, it's worth knowing about. Somewhere in here, if I can find it, I've even got a picture of Kyle and his, uh, his newest product. Got to find them though. Oh, there's Bob Tarsio. Well, give me a minute, and I'll I'll try and bring some more down here. Uh, I've I've still haven't obviously still haven't had time to find a rotator for uh, 
world world cast world cast another one with some very good uh, low power transmitters uh the acreso and as you probably are aware acreso is what supplies crown uh, as an oem and in the new aio transmitter from worldcast they built in a decoder so that if you are sending uh, your programming to them down the uh, internet, all you need is an encoder, and their encoder is $1,500. So you've already got the decoder and the transmitter, the encoder $1,500. That could save you 2500 bucks if you're going to buy a, a pair of uh, bigger codecs. But for those of you that know Al, he was uh, he was at the show and, as usual, smiling. Their uh, their consoles are pretty much the same, although they've uh, the thing that I thought that was interesting is right down here, if you can see on the spot where I'm pointing. Instead of having an LED readout, mic one, mic two, or something, it also has a little icon. So there's a microphone, or there's uh, EAS logo, or something like that. Makes it a little bit easier for the uh, the staff to uh, see what 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 they're dealing with. I thought that was a pretty neat little thing. Yeah, yeah Barry. Yes, David. The real impressive thing is that that that's backwards compatible. That you can put those modules into a, an older tub and so forth. Barry, you're muted. Yes, that's true. Uh, I thought that was really impressive for a quick update uh, of a console that you can do that. Well, they've tried very hard to keep their products relatively easy to use and uh, not overly complex in the sense that you can't um, uh, you can't go wrong with an SAS product no it's a you're driving a Cadillac definitely although they're not as expensive as uh, as some of the uh, similar ones. Very uh, true. I found their pricing to be very modest in, in, in a lot of ways. I've got also a picture here. I uh, let me going to have to download it from my phone and then upload it to the uh, uh, the screen here. But uh, Wheatstone has uh, updated their audio arts line, and they have a uh, the two of them are uh, digital. And they look very much like the uh, existing one, a little bit nicer. Uh, they did away with the uh, tip ring sleeve inputs in RJ45 now. But they have a mono version that will sell for $1,500 for an 8-pot analog mono board. Oh, I'm sorry, stereo, analog. Not mono, stereo. And it has built in USB and uh, Bluetooth for mix minus and for uh, input from your favorite jock's uh, laptop. Or not, as the case may be. And I haven't shot for an audio board in a while, but it just, I mean, it seems like a lot of them don't have AES or Dante output. I mean, I guess the you know the wheat wheatstone is uh is good, but a lot of them, it seems like they're just coming out with analog boards and they do have Bluetooth. But well, it depends okay. on what you're trying to do. Yeah, let's let's face it. If you're dealing with an LPFM, why are you going to be spending money for a digital console? If it's a little LPFM or a non-com. Uh, even in AM these days, let's face it, do you need a digital console or do you need something that's clean and easy to operate? 
that and also when you're running uh, Dante, uh, Wheatnet, Axia, uh, Ravenna, you're you're basically um, using less wires and having more capability because it's a great routing system. That was one of the questions I asked uh, Andy, uh, uh, Tony Gervasi, and he'll be with us um, maybe the second week of, of May here, I think. And that is how many stations really do uh, have the translation need between Wheatstone and Axia, let's say, for instance. And the reality is that most stations settle on one make and they don't have to deal with that. But if you do have that, there are products. Wheatstone makes one and the Intraplex from Gates Air does. He didn't like the word translate, but that's really what they do from one standard to another or one dialect of AES 67 to another. But again, right. just, 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 just to go back to that console issue, if you're dealing with a small, I mean, these guys are having a hard time being in the right place. As we talked about last week, there's so many of them that are nowhere near where their coordinates say they are. And uh, so you want something that can be operated by volunteer staff without too much trouble you want it to be clean reliable and and to me that's the key thing you don't want a console that's going to fall apart in your hands we also had the uh, case where we had a lot of people with uh, small home studios and uh, you know yeah. one instinct might be to go with a macking mixer but the other instinct is well let me get something closer to an actual radio console if for nothing else the Q function you know it's so, yeah. uh, so that's where we wound up looking for certain people uh, who didn't have sort of any kind of technical talent which is the audio arts kind of a of a thing you know a, a console that is so simple and basic you know, basically <laughs> if you if you understand if you move the slider up it gets louder you, you got it Oh, yeah. Give me a moment and I'll show you the Wheatstone here. I saw several, including in the uh, Lavo, uh, and the uh, AEQ has a beautiful one where the presets, and you go from one preset to another, and all the pots move. It, it, it's, it's really something. So, broadcast devices and Bob Tarsio, what do you have this year? Well, we have the old standby PPS 100D power meters, which we've had for a lot of years, but we're interfacing those to our new SWP 300 remote control and motorized switch controller. We have our new RF safety panel, which also doubles as an interlock consolidation panel for master antenna systems. And we have a brand new audio switcher, 16 channels, uh, mono or eight stereo, and it has a serial interface that can connect to the Sage NDEC and the DASDEC um, yeah. PAS systems. That's something that I heard a few people talking about. If you have a uh, digital system and you come down to the AS box, you go digital to analog and then analog back to digital. And that's not a very popular thing to do. And in talking to Bill Robertson, he made the point that in the DASDEC, where you can append or prepend or postpend uh, a file, uh, to the um, actual alert, they do it all in wave form. And the reason for that is because they want it to sound decent in the uh, digital uh, domain uh, rather than to, to suddenly sound like something like that. So. All right. Was uh, Bob still selling uh, cards to uh, update your uh, Gatesway 80 console? So selling cards cards to what? To uh, update the electronics in your Gatesway 80 console. Oh. <laughs> uh, I don't know about that one. but That's what, that's what got him into, into, into business uh, many, many years ago. And yeah. they were damn good cards. And Jim Wood started Novonics by doing what? Anyone remember? 
the electronics for uh, an Amtex uh, 300 or something 351. like that? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so now we, we're with Simeon Johnson of Broadcast Bionics in London. Oh. I gotta find that. I texted you his new AM um, mod monitor field strength meter just a second ago. We're with Simeon Johnson of Broadcast Bionics in London, and here he has a rack of equipment that is all in software. Yeah, indeed. We're showing on the screen here just a video demonstrating the kind of things that you can put in your virtual rack. Of course, the virtual rack doesn't exist with the screen because it's a box that you can put in your radio station or broadcast facility, and inside that you can load container-based uh, broadcast applications that traditionally would have been hardware units that you bolt into an actual rack. Broadcasters now are making software versions of these old products and the advantage is that you can uh, buy and license these as and when you need them without having to have physical hardware sitting around in your station and spare parts for example you don't need different power supplies for different pieces of kit because it's all just running on one um, computer application. And what Virtual Rack allows you to do is provides a really easy way of getting running with these containerized applications. Uh -huh. uh, so normally you'd need to learn Linux, Docker, and very complicated stuff, which uh, can take a long time to master. But with Virtual Rack, you can just buy some hardware, put our software on top, and then you've got access to a machine that's fully configured, ready to host these broadcast applications. And you can pick them from a library, tick install and get up and running in just minutes. It's great. Thank you very much. No worries. It was a pretty interesting uh, concept to, and I've seen it. I mean, you start, what was maybe one of the first ones that I remember was the uh, PCN 1600 uh, Orban, which was just software put on a computer. Um, of course, that's really where Orban inside or Omnia inside are basically software put on a card. And now we're seeing more and more audio processors, uh, and control things that are done in a uh, software environment. And pretty soon, <laughs> our radio studios that used to have tape recorders and cart machines and turntables, and you got a computer and a microphone. You could say not, not much to break. Uh, but if you do lose your computer, you are pretty much down and out, aren't you? Well, ever since COVID, when, uh, you know, we sent everybody home and had them operate remote, that's, uh, that's kind of what it, what it's been remote access into, uh, you know, uh, software or, or, or real consoles, uh, you know, back, back at, uh, back at home base. I had one other question for you, Barry, because I saw, was watching the, uh, NAB, uh, daily that was, uh, available, uh, online and of course aws is one of the sponsors of the show so you know every third item is aws this aws that uh, on the radio side and among uh, the those people does anybody really talk about aws and radio station in the cloud and studio in the cloud and things like that or is that more of something that the TV and the over the top people spend more time talking about actually several of them. There is, in fact, a company called Radio.Cloud, and they're an automation system, and their whole thing is to conduct it through the cloud. There are several others, um, and I'm and I'm and I'm going to sit here and, and it, the uh, Stream Guys uh, is now got a new service, a reflector service. So if you want to use them uh, for your STL you can send your program to them and they'll relay it to your transmitter. Um, relatively inexpensive. I think, I think they said it was under a hundred dollars a month uh, for some of the, uh, the uh, options. If you have buildings in the way between your transmitter and studio, or you just can't get the right kind of service. Now that's uh, something that, that makes a lot of sense. I was thinking back in the days when we went from $25, $30 per, 
program loops to two thousand dollar program loops. And that's you know a little shocking. If you can get if you can get them. Yeah. Because the telcos don't want to do it anymore. I, one one I thing haven't that, had good luck. We're with Darren Palegy at Wheatstone and we're looking at the brand new audio arts. Yes, sir. Their replacement for the Air One. Air One, yes. So right now we're looking at the uh, AML console. This is our Air One replacement. Um, this has two, two stereo buses. It's an analog console, two mic preamps, four stereo line inputs. We have a collar that's going to give you a mix minus output, and we have a USB to interface any computer via USB. Um, it is all RJ45 connections and wiring minus the USB. And it does have two mic preamps. Target price on this for uh, for uh, for selling is fifteen hundred dollars U.S. retail. All right. Now that's all analog, and now that's we have all the analog. digital ones. These two consoles here are called the DLMs, and we got the DLM Lyric and the DLM Verse. And one is a twelve fader, and one is an eight fader. These consoles are an all digital console. Um, the only analog on this console is going to be your mic inputs. You have your two mic pre's and or inputs for an external line level using an external processor like our Voice One. All your other inputs are going to be AES or SPDIF digital. Um, and then we give you two USBs for two PC interfaces via USB. And then we give you a Bluetooth and or digital hybrid fader. With the Bluetooth, you'll be able to connect your cell phone, bring the collar into the fader, and the return audio is going to provide you a mix minus. Target on this, uh, price-wise, is a $6,000 retail price. The DLM Verse is exactly the same uh, feature set for the most part as the Lyric. However, on this console, um, we're only going to give you one USB instead of two that was on the previous console. Same three buses. Um, and our collar on this one is going to be wired collar digital hybrid only. The price on this, and it's eight faders, and the price on this is a $5,000 retail price range. All right. Well, thank you, Darren. Appreciate it. You're welcome. They also have some updates to their audio processor. It, actually, they, uh, the, the uh, different companies have, have done that, although uh, Innovotics didn't really change their David much this year. Uh, I talked to Frank Foti, who will be with us again uh, in the coming uh, month or so, and talking about some of the things he's done uh, to bring surround sound into a stereo environment or to give you uh, just the things he's done to make the audio sound sweeter. And Frank is working hard to uh, bring some new folks in. Talking about new folks... Uh, is he worked with Corny Gould for a long time, and Corny's been working with uh, Angry Audio. And as those of you that have been with us a number of times, uh, the mic compressors, the streaming compressors, headset uh, amplifiers, all the different gizmos that Catfish has uh, uh, led us into. So a lot more to talk about. I, I could, you know, I could show you more little clips here for an hour or so, but there were so many booths. There's so many people to talk to. Uh, it's funny because you could say we need an extra day or two. On the other hand, after three days, I got to tell you, I'm worn out. I'm glad to be back home. So uh, I hope that, uh, uh, sort of taste of what NAB was.